So good morning. Class is going to be a little different today because our machines aren't working. Um, this camera, well, it can actually stand there like that. So maybe that's what I'll do. I'll just stand it like that. It's just that if I get excited and I thump the table, the camera will go. You do that you know, how, how they do. But, so, yeah, the, my computer works. It just this doesn't But I can't get the projector on because... It looks like this touchpad has lost connection with the controller. And I called the phone number that it says to get it fixed, and they didn't answer. So, and but the message was that the university is fucked. Oh, oh I'm sorry, the university is screwed. Oh, that's more yeah, appropriate. Right now. <laughs> Lots of different, oh shoot, I had that recorded. <laughs> No, I, that would require software and skill, and uh, just OBS. I just like, totally ignore all of that. Remember, I discovered in freshman year of college that I didn't have something called talent. I still, I still don't know what talent is. Um, well, how do you know you don't have it if you don't know what it is? Because um, the uh, music teacher that told me that. I knew what he was talking about, <laughs> I suppose. Um, so anyway, today we're supposed to begin the modern period. And it, what are they trying to tell me? Win, Windows update. So let them be totally screwed up. Um, so we're supposed to start today the modern period, which is probably why all of our modern technology isn't working. Um, but uh, in any case, um, I, I did want to finish up a few things. Um, I hope, hope you have devices if you want to look stuff up, or if you just have a marvelous memory, you could just remember whatever. If you'd like, I could actually write on this device, because that should still work. It's not plugged in, but I think it will still work. Um, in any case, um, Thomas uh, Aquinas was the one we were talking about. Uh, I noticed in uh, my notes uh, that I had extra notes for a whole other class on the Middle Ages, and because of uh, my interest in moving forward faster, I, I skipped a whole class on the Middle Ages. I hope no one's especially concerned. But I did post the notes that you would have seen had we you know, spent extra time on them. And there were two quiz questions there that you're welcome to still answer if you'd like. Uh, the first one was, uh, what do you think of Thomas Aquinas' angels? Remember I was talking about the, the nature of uh, uh, science today, talks about the four forces of the universe and my odd thesis that, that those are essentially what Aquinas was trying to explain uh, that uh, were referred to as angels in that day. Because uh, most of the cute little cherubs and things, that's not at all uh, what they really were talking about, at least on Aquinas's level in the Summa. Uh, he's talking about the forces that are in between God and the universe. And so, so there's invisible, non-material things that somehow communicate God's plan or, or arrangement uh, into the universe. And so what could that be? If we, we think about that in modern terminology, the closest I have is uh, the four forces, which you know are supposed to be all light, essentially. Uh, and uh, it's kind of interesting uh, and I, I think I mentioned uh, 
the monk Robert Grossetest, who also in one of his books uh, talks about how everything is made of light. Uh, and in a very modern way, you know, uh, you know, he doesn't get into wavelength and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, but the modern uh, conception of the forces in the universe, um, which are the, the strong and weak nuclear forces, uh, the gravitational force, and the electromagnetic force, are all considered waves on a continuum. I don't know if you, I'd show you, I'd show you that if you... But we talked about that, and so I ask what you think of that whole idea. Was Aquinas talking about the same thing? Not a, obviously, not exactly. He's, he's, I don't think he could have imagined the way science would have led. But still, I find it interesting, and it's not, not silly little things. You know that there's you know cute little angels, etc. Even though you have those designs all over churches and everything. The other question I have uh, uh, on that same quiz uh, week uh, would have been, uh, was uh, Aquinas uh, the kind of person that would chase a woman out of his tower with a f fiery uh, torch? Um, uh, the story goes that his parents didn't want him to join the Dominican order because the Dominican order was brand new, had no wealth. It was just, you know, a, a bunch of impoverished, smart, you know, individuals that dressed funny. Uh, and uh, mom and dad absolutely refused to let him, they, they wanted him to join the Benedictine order, which was very powerful. And in fact, he had been in the monastery and, and all that stuff. So they wanted him to join that one. Um, so they locked him in a tower and by the way, uh, tourists can go and visit this castle, and it has a sign on it that says, uh, "You can, you can, uh, you know what this this is the castle where Aquinas was locked in the tower, and there's the tower, so you can, you know, imagine, you know, Aquinas, Aquinas, let down your hair. <laughs> no, that's Rapunzel, different story, uh, but." Um, the Dominicans did come and rescue him, and so he did escape. Uh, oh, one other thing. The castle, one of the students, when I was explaining that to the class and I showed a little picture of the castle, uh, um, said, I went there in my grammar school class. We, you know, we were there, and they took us to, and we saw that, because she was Roman Catholic, I guess. So, so that's just all neat. But so I ask this dumb question, do you think Aquinas would have chased a woman out? Because um, they, they tried to, uh, uh, they, they, they hired a woman to go in and, and it, you know, kind of get him to sin, thinking that then he would not be able to join the Dominicans, but he apparently chased her away. Who's the they? When they write about the saints, they call it hagiography. That's the name of, of writing about the saints. So they're like biographies about the saints. And it's pretty clear that the stories that are told about them are, you know, some of it is based on real life, probably, you know, how history is. But an awful lot of it is probably just bunkus, you know, that makes the person sound like absolutely amazing. And so that's, I think, one of those bunkus stories about him. Okay, so enough about Aquinas. His, his work merged Aristotelian thought with the Platonic dogma of the church. And as a result, as you saw with the Sume, uh, you've got the objections and the responses and his, his uh, I say that, which basically resolves all the conflicts between Aristotelian thought and, and, and that. Of course, the issue with the soul is the soul goes with the body. So if uh, you're going to go to heaven, you need your body to go with you, which is kind of the new you know, uh, version of, of the soul going to heaven. Uh, and hence, you've got this whole business of the body has to resurrect. So if you remember the stories, you know, the, you know it changed at a certain point at least for some, that 
that when Jesus comes on the second coming, all the saved bodies will actually rise up again and all the arguments over, oh my goodness, that sounds like, you know, the, the zombies or the, you know, the, you know, people running around going brains, you know, and horrible things. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating, you know, how they tried to handle all of that. Um, in any case, um, there are two others uh, that are really significant in the late uh, scholastic period. This is all called the scholastic period. And one of those is William of Ockham. Probably everyone's heard at least of Ockham's Razor. Yes? Uh, Ockham's Razor is basically also called the law of parsimony. And what it means is that um, when you have a situation or a problem and you've got multiple explanations to explain what's going on, the simplest explanation is usually the best one. All, all things considered, you know, uh, everything being equal, you know, that the simplest explanation is probably the right one. That's William of Ockham. And William of Ockham was an Aristotelian, and he didn't believe in the existence of universals or, you know, abstract nouns, as if they actually existed in some way. So he was very Aristotelian. Another uh, interesting uh, uh, theologian philosopher at about the same time was Duns Scotus. So D-U-N-S Scotus, S-C-O-T-U-S, which actually didn't mean the Scot. <laughs> It, at the time, meant he was Irish, actually, which is odd. Uh, but Duns uh, um, is the one where we get the idea of a dunce cuff, or what, what do you say, a, a dunceman, a dunce cap, uh, and the pointy cap and everything. Uh, and you, you know, the teacher calls you a dunce and sits you in the corner for punishment. They don't do that anymore, I don't think. That's kind of insulting. Um, but what was funny is the dunsmen were actually considered so smart <laughs> that it's really just the opposite, that they really were very intelligent. And, and they, he, he and his followers wore a kind of pointy hat. wasn't that pointy. Uh, but Dunce uh, was a platonic uh, philosopher. And so he actually was just the opposite of William of Ockham. William of Ockham thought only individual things existed, but Duns uh, believed that there were actual universals that existed and that these things kind of participate in, in that. So, so he, and he's not silly, it's actually considered to be a really uh, difficult uh, logical uh, situation, but um, he's considered to be really brilliant and worth listening to. And when they talk about uh, Occam's razor, they, they say uh, Occam's razor uh, has frequently been dulled on Plato's beard. <laughs> and Plato, of course, would be a reference to the Platonist dunsman uh, as opposed to... So, so it's kind of interesting. Sometimes the solutions really seem to be, be more kind of platonic uh, than, than uh, Aristotelian. So that was interesting. And the main reason I like to think of, of, you know, even though Aquinas kind of solved all the problems, although it took a while before the church officially dubbed him like, this is official, this is our, our dogma. I think it was 1950, you know, so that's... Like hundreds of years That's later. hundreds of years later, you know, but he's officially still today the uh, dogma of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and, and what is the main thing about that? The, the thing is that, that faith and reason are the two wings on which we fly. It's an oft-quoted uh, thing. Uh, and, you know, the faith, you know, you figure is the one wing and the other one is reason. Uh, Aquinas says whenever there's a conflict between faith and reason, faith loses to reason. So, so you have to, as science advances, you have to readjust your, your dogma in order to fit you know, with um, the new things that science teaches. So that's kind of important, right? Um, that is probably one of the main reasons that so many 
Augustinians, they're all Augustinians actually, uh, that re rebel against the church. And, it, and we end up with what was end, ended up being called the Reformation. Uh, Martin Luther was an Augustinian. John Calvin was a, an Augustinian. I don't know what John Knox was, but he was a close friend of, of Calvin in Switzerland and Geneva uh, and went back, and he's the one that starts the Protestant uh, 